we move over to, the, let's say, the more general discussion about the lessons we have learned here. What, what, what are the take-home messages for, because basically um, on the, the, the uh, Google uh, uh, document where we collect uh, comments and uh, notes, um, I have um, identified three, uh, a wish list of three things that I would like to, to collect. Recommendations for educators, because that was one of the purposes from, of this uh, workshop. What do we learn? What can educators learn um, if they want to uh, facilitate collaboration between the two uh, parts? And secondly, recommendations for research infrastructures, because would, could they have, a, they have a role in, in uh, 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 providing extra support to, to co collaboration and also collaborations to the, let's say, the community, at, uh, recommendations to the community at large. So what, there's one thing, uh, I've heard in almost all the talks, I think, that is that people have to learn to talk to each other, to communicate, uh, lack of understanding. So that's, it's a very important point because it's, uh, as I said, I mean, it, it's a recurring point. And now, of course, we can tell this to the educators. Please make sure that people, that there's no longer a lack of understanding. But how can we do that? Would you have concrete suggestions for how to achieve that? What would your advice to a, a teacher be if a teacher says, well, I'm now going to set up a course for people about collaboration and I want to, to, to let them talk to each other. Where do you start? I don't have the answer. I'm just asking you because I would love to have some sort of starting point. For you start from learning the terminology. You have to learn the terminology. You have to know how to, uh, uh, how to explain what you want uh, to your uh, counterpart in, in the computer studies. You cannot do it with your fingers only. <laughs> and and, and this, uh, it's not a matter of uh, reading one article or something. Uh, as I said, I, I believe we need serious, well-built um, um, course, university course, and not for, for first year BA students, but for advanced MA and PhD students. Um, and to teach them um, the, 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 the concepts, uh, to teach them what uh, they can ask about from computer people and how to ask it. I believe it's, it's at least one semester uh, serious, serious university course, maybe a year. Okay. But, and we, don't, we, don't, we don't have it because uh, uh, when, when I entered this field and I asked my colleagues, where can I learn something? And then it's suddenly a question, you know, and do you know any math? <laughs> can you learn some computing? And then it's the, the, the answer is obviously, no, I cannot re really, uh, you know, um, after, after all the years in the humanities, I, I cannot make serious computer studies, but I still need to understand the, the, the general understanding. And this is this would be in in high demand, I believe, in the in the following years. Okay, thank you. But this should also work the other way around because, in order to be able to, to talk to each other, the the they both have to have an understanding of their terminology. So the computer scientist that you want to collaborate with, we also have to learn your terminology because I'm sure that almost all the concepts you use in your daily research life are totally unknown to the computer scientist. Yeah, please, Robert. Menno has a comment, I think. So, so. Can I quickly chime in? So I, I completely agree uh, with what you're saying. So, yeah, I mean, I think the essential part is learning each other's terminology. Um, I'm just wondering if there's not a, a more kind of high level approach of doing this. So instead of doing a, a kind of hands on, what do you say, within a particular project, trying to learn each other's terminology, try to find a way to have an approach to learn terminology, even in new situations. So I, I agree what you're saying. We need to learn terminology. If you don't have the same terminology, or at least partially understand the same terminology, then it's not going to work. Um, but can't we find a way um, of learning how to learn terminology? So perhaps have students sit together and, okay, well, you come from different areas. We'll try and sort it out, see where the problems, uh, where the problems lie and try to find some sort of, um, 
ways of of figuring out what's the easiest way to find the common ground. Uh, th at least that's what we tried in our our project. Uh, and I'm not saying that we we uh, did that fully successfully. I'm I'm still struggling. But I think having a like a, a meta learning um, approach there is probably more useful. Mm -hmm. uh, also to apply to other uh, situations. But also more ambitious. But of course, once you've Maybe got also it, more it pays off. I think or to, teach, or to teach students to explain their needs or requirements um, so clearly that they don't need terminology. So that the other person will be able to translate into their own terminology. Uh, Kirill has a comment and then Robert. Okay, uh, sorry. Yeah. I think uh, we can uh, learn from the history in a sense that if you take a look on the computational linguistics, uh, the area developed exactly in the the same way. At the beginning, uh, there were two communities and they involved uh, slowly in one. And uh, especially for education, I think uh, joint programs like uh, joint uh, data science uh, for humanities or humanities for data scientists will be quite useful, uh, probably on the master level. And uh, for computational linguistics, it's uh, took about uh, 30 years to get there. Probably here we can be quicker uh, to learn better from each other. Yeah, thanks. Robert? Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for the organizing. You have to. Oh, aren't I unmuted? No, no, no. You're very hard to understand. Am I hard to hear? This is better. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, First of all, thank you to the organizers for putting this together. This has been a, a wonderful um, series of presentations and also the other colleagues who presented. Um, it definitely is a two-way street in terms of things. Um, you know, a lot of the technology people also um, don't understand what we need um, and they tend to come up with uh, much uh, more detailed um, ways of collecting information like with the 3D scans and actually are necessary for us, but they have the technology um, and they want to use it and uh, they want to apply it to everything. And so, uh, you know, we've really been doing a lot of work trying to figure out which are the best ones, um, you know, the optimal ones for us to use. Um, and the same goes in terms of a lot of the other projects in machine learning. Um, sometimes, you know, they're finding things that, you know, we already knew. It's nice to see that um, we can get uh, corroboration through such high tech uh, um, methodologies, but then again, it's sometimes sort of using a, a sledgehammer to do something that, you know, a small hammer can, can actually do. In terms of getting these discussions going, um, at the Holocaust Museum, we've had workshops, uh, two week workshops and one week and uh, workshops and conferences. The first one we did in 2008 was on GIS and the Holocaust, which led to uh, geographies of the Holocaust, a volume that was published by and Knowles and Paul Jaskett and others, where we brought together um, 10 to 12 people from GIS and historians um, uh, to really look at what the information is, what information is available, and how the technologies can help in terms of understanding uh, people, you know, movements of populations, um, materials, and other things. Um, it was highly successful. But it really took the first week for everybody to sit down around the table and hammer out the terminology. What really were people saying um, behind that? And it's not just understanding what a term means, but the, the depth of it, um, incorporating sort of the, um, uh, the parlance um, and moving that along. And we've done the same thing with, in terms of material culture, trying to bring together uh, people in the material culture, historians and others, to try to sit down and really hash through what this is. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there's much you can do other than programs like that, where you do intensive, uh, you know, day long or week long or two week long um, programs to really get people thinking and working and collaborating and understanding what's happening. Um, it almost sounds like it's a DH project unto itself in terms of coming up with a, a translator for different things or, or understanding. But I do think the human factor is really what needs to be done. And it means also checking egos at the door. 
because a lot of times we have a tendency to go in thinking we understand everything and all the different details and they don't understand. And of course they come in thinking, you don't understand what we can do for you and what the power is. And you, you know, are just terrified of, of computers and therefore um, that's your problem. So that's also one of those issues we have to deal with. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any more people in the queue? Okay, well, I, I have a question to, to Kido because you're, in your presentation, you did not mention any, let's say, collaboration problems or issues. You, you just said, well, we, we uh, work together with the people from the, what was it, the library, and uh, we had a very good division of labor, and did, did you encounter any obstacles when you uh, did this work? Or did it all go very smoothly without any problem? Well, from my point of view, everything was quite fine. Uh, <coughs> Uh, we met several times in uh, face, uh, face to face uh, to discuss some of the topics and most of the time uh, online. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Ivan, if uh, he wants to say something about this, it will be also useful. Uh, but uh, for the moment, uh, especially if with the library, uh, uh, they are very, very uh, responsive both and responsive to what we did. In a sense, uh, when we ask them to prepare uh, uh, some uh, materials from some uh, period, if they don't have it, uh, uh, they found in, uh, find uh, it in, uh, in their collections and uh, scan for us, uh, what was quite uh, useful for this task. Ivan, do you want to say something? Thank you for the kind words. Uh, do you hear me well? Yeah, I hear you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, uh, it was uh, uh, very new for us to participate in the CLADA project. And it was uh, really a very good experience to work with uh, uh, people from uh, science mostly because we librarians, we don't really work, especially in the computer uh, uh, field with scientific uh, people from the science community. So uh, indeed, it was a very good experience for us to learn to communicate with people uh, in a different kind of way so that uh, we can understand each other. We librarians and the computer science people. So we, for us, it's really great experience. Okay, thank you. That's it. Jakub good. had a nice question in the chat. Okay. Jakub, could you repeat I it? I can't. Let me see. Yes, of course. Yeah, Jakub, you're... Okay, so yeah. I'll read it aloud. Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> Regarding the uh, USHMM exhibition, uh, I assume VR is a medium that we usually associate with entertainment and play. Uh, were there any challenges with presenting the topic in its seriousness to a wider audience? And how were they overcome in digital and humanities experts collaboration? So I guess I'm probably the best person to, to answer that. Yes, it's absolutely the reason we've been doing it is because of the complication of, of trying to figure out how to transfer something that is a historical experience into VR. Uh, and that there are a huge number, as you can imagine, um, possible ways to do it really, really wrong. Uh, so the work that we've done in VR so far has been largely on a learning basis. Uh, it's mainly been prototyping uh, to work with audiences and scholars uh, to kind of to see and understand the impact more. Uh, and what we have um, been learning about is really to question the kind of impact that VR has uh, and move away from some of the popular concepts of using VR as a methodology for um, evoking empathy and move towards more of an understanding of, of, of VR as a way of understanding role and space. Um, and our initial, um, our initial uh, uh, larger scale, we've been experimenting with it in a bunch of different ways and I won't get into all the details with that. So, um, although if somebody wants to follow up with me later, please contact me, we can talk more. Um, the, the most recent kind of full scale piece that we did, we did it as a residency within the museum with audiences and scholars within the museum over the course of two weeks. 
Uh, and that gave us a lot of time to really understand uh, the questions from a historical perspective, but also the impact it was having on audiences and try to bring those two things together. Um, and so, um, I, you know, in terms of conclusions, what we would say is that um, while many of the scholars we were working with had initial concerns about um, the appropriateness of VR as a way to interact with the history, uh, all of them came out of it feeling like we are, were finding ways to actually not have any problem with that. What they really wanted was greater transparency about how decisions that had historical implications were being made. Um, that was really their main concern by the end of the project was really trying to be more transparent about the research going on beyond the VR, behind the VR, rather than um, being worried about the appropriateness of the content. Does that answer the question enough? Or uh, like, again, I could talk about this for like an hour, so I don't wanna, I don't Robert wanna Robert also wants to address this question from a research perspective. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, Michael and I um, have been working together a long time and with Jane as well about VR and different aspects. And, um, you know, there's also VR for research purposes as well. Um, which also has some issues to it. Um, the idea that people can, uh, in virtual reality, sort of meet at a site and go through and investigate and talk um, is very important in terms of moving research forward. But, you know, it also is important to make everybody understand that this is virtual. This is not reality. We're seeing, you know, what um, in archaeology is a little easier. That's my field. Um, because you're looking at the remains of the site, but you know there are a lot of questions that come up with if, um, ethical issues like do you reconstruct a site? You know how realistic can it be for research and teaching? Like Michael said, there are many, many, many ways of doing this wrong, really wrong. Um, and so you know VR um, is becoming a big tool for research, but there's also it's different trying to see Mars in 3D and investigate that and trying to see a killing site in 3D and going through that and missing um, the important uh, aspects of what you're really viewing. Okay, thank you. So Hi. Stephen, uh, what I think we uh, should also try and find out from the audience is how we can move a, st a step forward from these fabulous uh, individual collaboration um, experiences to something that is more systematic and if there's a role of research infrastructures in trying to make this kind of collaboration more systematic. Yeah, okay, can I add one thing because I was just thinking about the role of infrastructures because one of the speakers mentioned uh, the, the absence of a platform where uh, let's say humanities researchers could meet um, let's say, uh, computer scientists or technical people. And I think when I first heard the word platform, I thought, oh no, not yet another software platform that does all the wonderful things. This was about a real platform where people, people could meet each other. And so it's more like a, a dating site where a humanist, a humanity researcher could date with a, um, a, a computer scientist. So, and it, that could be an interesting thing to reflect on for the, the research infrastructures because they address a, a huge community of people with many different backgrounds and skills. And of course, there's, there is a danger because I've heard this complaint before that if you uh, set up such a dating site, there is a danger that it degenerates into, let's say, an escort site where one person has a, a desire to do some, something and there's another part person who's willing to be paid to do that. But that's of course what you don't want because what you want to create is dates where people on an equal basis want to collaborate and build something, make something new that couldn't exist without their collaboration. So, but I think the, the dating site idea is certainly something that the research infra infrastructure should take up. And there's one other thing, but after that, the, the audience can also um, come in. Um, someone else gave the example of the, the, let's say, the Excel sheet. And I think that reminded me of another uh, Twin Talks workshop where someone said, well, you, you may want to, to develop a common language you speak, but you could also develop some sort of, let's say, uh, common, uh, let's say, uh, uh, for, for, formalism that both parties understand. And I think Excel is an excellent example because I'm sure that all digital human, humanists under, understand Excel. They can all make an Excel database, uh, represent the things in Excel. And uh, of course, they may not be capable of performing 
uh, very complex operations on them, operations that go beyond the capability of Excel. But if you, but I'm sure that on the basis of an Excel example, um, humanities researchers and computer scientists would be able to figure out what people want to do, what they can do, because on the Excel example would then be the sort of interlingua between the two. But that's uh, an approach that uh, I could very well imagine would work. But okay, now I want to give the floor to the audience with ideas, suggestions, wishes. I don't know. Do we have? Do uh, I, we have I can add uh, something to as a uh, response to your question. We didn't have problems with the library, but we have problems with some other uh, organizations. And the main uh, problem is that uh, people that are working, let's say, on some data or some collections uh, for many years, they are not very willing to share this with others because they think uh, that uh, this is their child and it's so hard uh, to develop. And in the end, somebody wants to change uh, and to make it available in different way. Uh, so probably here again, the infrastructures can help to show that uh, this is just one step and in the end, uh, this will help also to back to the people that develop uh, the initial collections of data and uh, representations. Yeah. No, thank you. That's a very good point. But as I told at the beginning, organizations like uh, Clarin and Daria and the Shock Project are all about sharing because sharing is essential. If you are not willing to share, then you're not really part of the community, I think. And I also think that the, the funding agencies have very well understood this point because these days, if you want to get funding from European Commission, from your National Research Council to do research, to collect data, the, the condition is always that you should be willing to share it. And if you don't want to share, there is no funding. And I think that's excellent. I think it is Daria who expressed her uh, wish to comment, and then Menon, and then Valier, and then Philip. Okay, please. It's one small note, but um, <laughs> which I forgot to mention. Um, what computer people do have to learn, and they better learn it fast. <laughs> Uh, is that uh, I, I come from one of those uh, spheres in the humanities where people get to serious achievements at a relatively um, advanced age because uh, it requires uh, many years of, of uh, experience with the material. And um, uh, what people don't understand is that when you are building a database or you are building a library site, you have to take into consideration that nobody wants that, you know, very uh, beautiful, uh, like uh, looking like a telephone screen, um, wonderful bright windows, excellent. Just I, I, I talked to many people and they told me in the National Library of Israel, there was one useful link at the very bottom. It was called go to the old uh, search engine. And they all clicked on it, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and this year, they removed the old search engine. And it's not only the National Library. Um, people have to have like some small, small course on, you know, what uh, what uh, um, uh, some um, scientist uh, researcher in the humanities in his late fifties, what does he want a site to look like? <laughs> because really, people suffer a lot, <laughs> a lot. Yeah, yeah, I can I can imagine because it's uh, for if you are not brought up with uh, the digital in the digital world, it's very hard to to acquire the skills and the understanding to, at a later age. And uh, and it's it's okay if all these modern new things come up, but they should not completely replace the things that were um, widely used and well accepted and very usable. So innovation is okay, but not always instead of what was there, but complementing it. Yeah, that's a very good point. Who's next? Okay, I think I'm next now. Okay, I, yeah. actually, I actually love your, your comment, uh, Daria. Um, so I'm from the computational side, um, and I actually had an, another complaint with Go, which goes 
I wouldn't say against what you're saying, but it's, um, it, I can tell you about the other side. Um, so my experience so far mostly has been that, that you, humanities researchers contact computational researchers and then ask, oh, I'd like to do this and this and this. And then as a computational researcher, you do that and you hand, you hand over the results and they say, okay, thank you, bye. And so there's no interaction. So what you're saying is the interaction goes from the other side and that's not happening. But from the computational side, that's not happening either. So I, I don't know, I've, I've helped many researchers with a lot of computational stuff and in a way you got nothing in return. And look, in, in some ways that's fine, right? If you can help people, that's okay. But at some point, the amount of hours that go in it. Um, look, it would be nice if you could actually get a publication together, for example. Um, so that's what we've been trying to, to, to go for now. At least have something, we're going to do this publication together. So I'm going to spend time, you're going to spend time, and we both actually benefit. So I think that that's an, um, you know, like a carrot on this, on the, on this stick. You, you, you're both going for the carrot and not just uh, here, I've, I've got your carrot and here you get it, or the other way around. Um, so that was actually my, my comment based on the, uh, the, the, the dating site. So I really love that idea, um, but my experience is exactly that, that you get somebody who wants to get something and isn't really willing to, to, to share. So I think if somebody, <laughs> actually I've been talking about, uh, with, with some people here in South Africa recently who also wanted something like that, but then for linguists and people annotate linguistic data, for example, to try and find each other. I think you've got the same issue there. Um, you need to find some way of being able to share the, the combined work. Um, otherwise, exactly, you get an, an escort service even without the pay. Um, <laughs> you don't want to have that. So I, I, we need to think of some way of making sure that it's in everybody's benefit to to find um, pairs or groups of people to collaborate and I, I i don't know exactly how we should do that but if we can solve that problem um then i think we'll have a, a wonderful uh, dating website yeah absolutely fully agree okay is anyone in the queue uh, sorry Who? No, I'm yes. not sure because it's we have... Valier and Philip. Okay, yeah. Valier, please open your mic. Yes, yes. Am I audible, please? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity. It was a, uh, it was a very uh, knowledgeable uh, and uh, beneficial uh, workshop for me, as I am the first comer and attending of this workshop and this DH conference. So thank you very much for, the, uh, for this. Uh, what I'm experiencing and what I'm sharing the experience is related to the project where I am working. Uh, the collaborative research scheme has funded this, the government of India has funded this project. And we have four people working in this uh, project. One is uh, from a uh, cognitive science background, another is from literature, another and one more is from uh, computer science and IT uh, department. And I me too, I'm, I'm from a uh, literature background. So the basic idea uh, is uh, behind this uh, project was to read literature for from psych cognitive science uh, perspective to develop some uh, technological uh, uh, devices to catch and to to read to understand the mindset of human beings. So this is what in brief. What I'm trying to share you they, there there are some difficulties in understanding the language and expression language of people uh, involved uh, in the project and uh, the way they try to see and try to witness, try to analyze the, uh, the expression of a person from humanities background. Uh, not only this, uh, when a person of humanities background uh, presents some idea, because he is very explanatory, sometimes he is very symbolical, sometimes he is uh, explaining some deep ideas before the people of science and technology, it becomes very difficult to, for them to understand because of their technical backgrounds. Right. What I did is I started uh, uh, making some important uh, uh, notes based on the words they use and the way they use the language to express their ideas. And uh, 
start uh, I started making some kind of meetings only on understanding the linguistics used by the people having different backgrounds. It helped me to cope with the problem of language because, because the people from language background, people from literature background, people from cognitive science, people from CSE and IET departments or background or knowledge, they have their own linguistic orientation, different kind of linguistic orientations they have. When they they, we, we sit together to write a research paper. Uh, simply uh, uh, recently, a paper was published by uh, Academic Press. Uh, their their expectations are different. Like uh, they want to see something explained in a very clear manner, whereas very mathematical manner. Whereas we people, literary people, try to expand the idea, try to explain things. So this linguistic variations in collaborative research uh, uh, schemes or the works are uh, always and it should be coped with, it should be eradicated, it should be solved uh, during the research period only. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, that's a very good observation. And uh, I think we all agree that this is a problem that we really need to address. And uh, thank you. it's good that it is really addressed in some places explicitly. Okay, I think if, if, if there's no one on, is there anyone on the list? Let me see. Oh. We still well, have Philip, but our time's up. So yeah. maybe a quick final comment from Very quick Philip? final comment. Ellen? Stephen, yeah. just a small remark concerning uh, the role of infrastructures that uh, was raised by Daria. I know we're running short of time. I think that the Daria working groups is a good example how to make uh, an infrastructure a dating site and not an escort service. Uh, I am. Uh, I have the honor to uh, chair one of the diary working groups that is our maintenance maintenance working group, and uh, there you can find this sort of collaboration that we all seek for, and uh, the ethic and the commitment and the uh, interdisciplinary approach and uh, this sort of uh, want one equal um, publication of uh, results that we all seek for. So we have a good example uh, within infra an infrastructure. I don't know if that works for Claring too as working groups, but um, these small groups under the, the umbrella, the big umbrella of uh, the DARIA EU uh, are actually working. Okay, excellent. Thank you. It's very good to know. And so I would recommend to all uh, people in the audience who are looking for such a service to, to have a look at the Daria site and see whether what's offered there suits their, their needs. So maybe now to, to Philip's comment, uh, we were... Oh, sorry. No problem. Uh, it, it is a little bit special because uh, the Excel sheet example was mentioned in our talk. Um, I just want to mention that uh, even, of, of course, you can exchange data with Excel sheets, but that doesn't spare you from lots of communications because you have to talk about the structure of your data, what's in the rows and what's in the columns and what to put in the cell. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We should not forget that. Okay, would that, this be a right moment if there's no one in the queue? to uh, start winding up. Well, I think um, I, I can give you my first impression. I've listened to some to, to very interesting talks with uh, all sorts of very relevant uh, comments and findings. And uh, I think the recurring items were about, uh, the, let's say, the two parties uh, being able to talk to each other, maybe through uh, terminology, maybe through courses where they learn about each other's uh, um, uh, concepts, um, maybe by uh, developing, uh, by, uh, let's say, uh, identifying formalisms that both the, the human, humanities research and the, the, the computer scientists could use. So all things along these lines should be developed further because, of course, by just making these observations, we are not there yet. Is only a starting point for thinking of actions, concrete actions that we could undertake in order to achieve these goals. And we have uh, heard about uh, the, uh, a dating site where we have, where we should certainly not reinvent things that are already there. So we should look very carefully at what Daria has to offer. And we will, I'm sure, within Clarin 
and also in shock we will see whether these things uh, suit our needs or whether we should uh, need something special. Are there any other general remarks that anyone would like to formulate as a take home message for? Um, I just have an invitation. If you enjoy these types of talks, um, feel free to uh, follow the development of our Riga Twin Talks edition. Um, there are uh, big chances it will be virtual as well. And you are uh, more than welcome to join us there as well. Okay, then I think I would like to thank you all, both the presenters and the, the uh, people from the audience for a very interesting and inspiring workshop. And also the, the organizers from the Clarion Office behind the screen and the members of the program committee who helped us putting together this uh, workshop. Mm -hmm.